Good, um, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us. I'm Sandro Kalea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean for the School of Public Health at Boston University. And welcome to the third part of our um, virtual symposium, Stopping Suicide, Population Health Approach. Uh, before I start, a few notes. First of all, I would like to thank the um, people who have been the intellectual architects of the symposium, the three uh, virtual uh, sessions we've had. Those are Professors Carol Dolan, Jamie Gradis, Sarah Lipson, and Julia Raifman. They uh, are the ones who got together and conceived of this and uh, put it in place, so thank you. I would like to thank our team, uh, particularly Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel, who are the ones who made it happen. Thank you. This is uh, the final part of the series of panels that we have um, been hosting to address the, really this daunting public health challenge of suicide prevention. We've had uh, our first panel, which was a series of experts discussing the causes um, uh, of uh, suicide. And we had uh, two keynote speakers from the World Health Organization Director of Mental Health and from the Director of National Institutes of Mental Health talking about state of the science and suicide. And now we're ending really on a panel about thinking of ways to prevent suicide. We uh, see suicide as a, as a critical public health issue, one and one around which public health has made relatively little progress over the past century, and one which we are increasingly worried about as we enter a time of uh, enormous social and economic stressors. And note to anybody who is um, participating and who is listening, if you are thinking about suicide, you're worried about a friend or a loved one, or would like emotional support, the Lifeline Network is available 24-7 across the United States, and we will put contact details in the chat box. Before we proceed with today's event, just a, a couple of notes about some upcoming events, uh, two of them which are for our community here at Boston University and one for the general public. Our activist lab is hosting a suicide prevention training for our community on October 20th. Um, we have re limited registration, as you can imagine, for training, but all details on this are on the school calendar. On October 22nd, member of our schools, members of our school's mental health, public health connections group and students in our mental health sub, um, uh, and substance use certificates are hosting a discussion about this same symposium. This is going to be a student led uh, discussion. It's going to be open to our entire school community. And on October 29th, open to everybody, uh, our activist lab is hosting a panel on suicide prevention in practice. This is going to be open to the public and there will be panelists, including our own Professor Dolan, who I mentioned before, as well as uh, um, uh, Dr. Kelly Cunningham, who's Director of Suicide Prevention Programs in Massachusetts, and Dr. Maura Weir, who is a uh, trainer about uh, um, suicide prevention. So th that event is coming up, and anybody can find information about all of these events on our website. Once again, thank you for joining us. I said thank you to the people who put this together, but I always feel like I want to say thank you to the audience. We realize that it's uh, everybody is busy and we are really grateful to you all for engaging with us in our public health conversations. So thank you for being here with us. Today, as I said, we have an outstanding panel. I'm actually really looking forward uh, to the panel and to the speakers. And I'm now going to turn it over to the moderator. The moderator today is going to be Professor Jamie Gradus, who is a professor of epidemiology at our school, as well as a professor of psychiatry at the School of Medicine. Uh, professor Gradus' research interests are the epidemiology of trauma and trauma-related disorders and has a particular focus on suicide outcomes. Uh, Professor Gradus has worked on a number of uh, federal and foundation funded grants um, about psychiatric epidemiologic approaches in the general population and in veterans. As I mentioned earlier, Professor Gradus has been one of the people who has been behind the symposium and she will lead us through today. Jamie, over to you and thank you. Thank you, Dean Galea, for that nice introduction. And I echo your sentiments. I'm very excited to hear from these outstanding speakers um, for today's panel. So to get started, I'll do a brief introduction of each speaker, and then we'll turn it over and begin the presentations. So first, we'll hear from Dr. Sherry Malik, who's a professor at George Washington University Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Malik's research specialties include risk and protective factors in suicide in African-American adolescents and young adults mental health help-seeking behaviors in African-American adolescents and young adults, developing suicide and HIV prevention programs in African-American faith-based communities, and HIV risk and suicidal behaviors in young African-American MSM. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Mark Hatzenbuehler, the John L. Loeb Associate Professor of the Social Sciences at Harvard University. Dr. Hassenbuehler's work examines the role of stigma in shaping population health inequalities, with a particular focus on the mental health consequences of structural forms of stigma. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Lisa Wexler. Dr. Wexler is a professor in the School of Social Work and at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan, and her research focuses on suicide prevention, wellness, resilience, and praxis. 
Fourth will be Dr. Natalie Riblett, Assistant Professor at the Dartmouth Geisel School of Medicine. In Dr. Riblett's current research roles, she's focused on identifying and testing interventions to prevent death by suicide. As part of her recent awards, Dr. Riblett will study a suicide prevention intervention that builds off her prior work with the goal of improving social connectedness and engagement in treatment after psychiatric hospitalization. Finally, and certainly not least, we'll hear from BUSPH's own Dr. Julia Raifman. Dr. Raifman conducts research on health and social policy drivers of population health and health inequalities, and she focuses her work on mental health and infectious diseases. So with those brief introductions, I'll turn it over to Dr. Malik. Um, over to you. Thank you. Hi, thank you for having me. Unfortunately, this is the time, even though I put my dogs up, they're out again. So I'm frantically <laughs> texting my husband and my children to please get the dogs. So hopefully you won't hear them that long. I want to thank you so much for inviting me to be with this esteemed panel and particularly with the School of Public Health at Boston University. It's an honor to be asked to do this. And I want to briefly just share a little bit about my work with looking at um, uh, suicide prevention for African-American youth, particularly in faith-based communities. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my slides. And Okay, if you all can see those, okay, if you can give me a thumbs up, you're good. Great, okay. So before I do that, I always like to talk a little bit about my context. And before we got started, I was jokingly with uh, Dr. Wexler, I was going to take these slides out, but she put her context in. So I'm putting mine in too. And I do think that's important. I think if you look at all the panelists, we all have a particular context. And I know that people talk a lot about cultural context with competence, which is not my favorite phrase, but I like to think of it more as contextually competent and that we all come from a context and we bring multiple identities and multiple contexts with us. And certainly the clients that we're trying to work with or the people who we're trying to work with to prevent suicide also have multiple contexts. And so that shapes the kinds of questions that I ask and they also shapes the kinds of answers that I can um, get from the kinds of questions I ask. So if you look at this um, slide, um, you'll notice that um, I'm a dog lover, which I said earlier, and so these are my two dogs. I've also, I'm a wife, uh, I'm a mom, I am a, a grandmother, and my husband and I am bivocational. So my husband and I, in addition to our respective um, to, uh, fields of work in psychology and law, we also co-pastor a uh, United Church of Christ, which is a Christian church in a suburb of Washington, DC. So I've been a, a psychologist for 35 years, but I've been in ministry for 20 years. And certainly that's not a coincidence that my, some of my work is in faith-based communities. I am a grandmother of a three and a half, of a three year old and a seven and a half year old who are the joys of my life. These are some of my favorite TV shows. I'm from Baltimore originally, so The Wire is one of my favorite shows. Um, these are the cuisines that I like to eat. This is me as my role as a therapist. I love citron tea, I love Thai food. These are my young adult children who are thir almost 30, 26 and 28. This is a picture of my dad who I hope I inherited his genes because he's 94 going strong. <laughs> so I wanna be like my dad when I, as I age. And this is my youngest daughter who lived in um, China for two years and lived in Korea for two years. She's very interested in East Asian cultures and is applying for a master's degree program uh, right now in that area in global studies. And she's um, tutoring my, my granddaughter. And then this is me and, and a picture of me preaching. And so all of this shapes who I am, it shapes how I see the world, it shapes the kinds of topics I'm interested in, shapes the kind of research questions I ask, and that all shapes what the realm under which those answers can occur. So just a little background, suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth ages 10 through 19. We know that unfortunately the suicide rates rose precipitously for um, African-American adolescents, particularly amongst African-American uh, males. And then unfortunately, um, all of this is unfortunate, but the suicide rates for black children ages five through 12 has approximately doubled for that of white children in similar age group. We also know that there's issues around intersectionality with sexual minority youth. So the suicide rates um, for attempts and ideation are higher in youth in the LGB community in general when compared to their heterosexual peers. And we also know that that might be even more elevated and students who are from communities of color when you look at college students. So really, I'm sure that in the previous um, conferences or symposia, 
that people talked about risk and protective factors. So I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on that. I do just wanna provide some context again. So we know there are many risk factors associated with um, suicide in youth, including history of suicide and depression or other mental health challenges. Certainly in, in the school to prison pipeline, we talked in um, other presentations about the fact that students from youth of, uh, from communities of color are more likely to have the disciplinary actions in schools, which then lead unfortunately to referrals to juvenile justice systems, which is a, a direct um, pipeline to the prisons um, for young people. Um, exposure to suicide behavior of others, access to lethal means, residential mobility. I often like to say that if we put a mental health clinic on every corner, if we don't provide people with stable housing, financial security, and food security, that that's really not gonna work. And so we really need to get people's basic needs met. I've already talked about being a member of a sexual minority group, certainly stigma and uh, so exposure to racial trauma and racial discrimination are all risk factors. Protective factors can be grouped into five categories, including family support, religious and spiritual engagement, community and social support, personal factors like positive self-esteem, and again, I'm gonna say over and over again, stable family housing, income and employment. People have a living, earnable wage. If people can have stable housing and people can have job security, that goes a long way to minimizing a lot of stress that families um, experience. In terms of protective factors, there's two things about that are particularly important. One, that people feel socially connected and I'm sure, I don't know if we're gonna talk about the impact of COVID-19, but one of the concerns that I have is that COVID-19 is uh, kind of like a perfect storm. And so you have a combination of a reduction in risk, an increase in risk factors and a reduction in protective factors going on at the same time. And so we know that social connectedness is really important at both the individual level with feeling connected with peers and our family members, but also at the community level with being embedded in a larger community. And that can be school, can be with uh, neighborhood clubs and advocacy groups, which are really important. It's also important that there's a concept called mattering, um, which is not just that people tolerate you or accept you, but that people celebrate who you are and that they, they, you feel like you make a difference in the lives of other people, that when you're absent, people notice that. People care about what you think. People celebrate when you're successful and they're sad with you and join with you in mourning when, you, when things don't go your way and that you feel that people can rely and depend on you. So what can we do to um, minimize or prevent suicide in ways that we don't help kids just survive but thrive? And what are things that we can do to minimize and or eliminate risk factors and simultaneously enhance protective factors at individual family, community and broader societal levels? So there's lots of things that we can do. And I'm gonna just give you one example, which is to using an upstream strategy for suicide prevention, which is to partner with churches. And I wanna say that um, my context is a Christian church. And I realize that there are other churches and sometimes there might be other issues with this, but the churches, when I talk about the black church, I'm talking about predominantly Protestant churches. So why should we consider partnerships with faith communities? The black church in particular is an excellent venue for promoting positive mental health. It is one of the most influential institutions in the black American community. And even though it is true that when you look at Pew Foundation data that People in general are less likely to go to organized religious institutions. That is not true in the black community. About 87% of black Americans are affiliated with the church and over 60% of black youth attend church regularly. And the good news about churches is challenging, but it's a good news um, for suicide prevention is that most people who go to black church are women and they're moms. And the person who decides whether or not children are also involved in church are always mothers. So why include faith communities in mental health care? Mental health issues affect people across different faith traditions. Faith leaders are often um, first responders. I know in my role as a minister, one of the things I like about it is that I make house calls. And so I also see people in lots of different contexts and I can kind of gauge people's mental health and the challenges that they're having because I see them in these multiple contexts. And also um, you develop really close relationships with family members in a way that you don't as a mental health professional. Um, we care for, ministers care for the whole person and the families, um, and they also um, include people from diverse workplaces and um, including mental health professionals. I've actually been involved in establishing two mental health um, centers in churches. One was a mega church where we 
saw about three or 400 people a month. And it was staffed by people in the church who were licensed mental health professionals. And then the second church was about a membership of about 1500. And I started a mental health center where we did short-term therapy. So I think there are definitely examples out there um, where people have developed services, mental health services that are provided by professionals within the faith community itself. And also sometimes we forget the mental health crises in a family are also sometimes crises of faith. There are barriers to seeking um, to develop partnerships with faith communities. Sometimes the faith community may believe that suicide violates family community or cultural norms. They may view mental illness as a sin or moral failing. Um, really a common um, concern that I hear is that people believe that suicide or any mental health challenge is a sign of weak faith or lack of faith, that if people's faith in a higher power was stronger that they wouldn't be experiencing mental health challenges. Also, I hear even more that suicide is something that white people do and that black people don't um, complete suicide. And people will sometimes talk about slavery and how people were resilient through slavery. But I remind people, slaves also jumped off of ships in the Middle Passage. And so we have always had um, black people, people in the diaspora completing suicide. What we haven't always had is a documentation of that. There's also, unfortunately, stigma, stigma associated not just with mental illness, but also with help seeking for mental health challenges. And then we know that for youth in the LGBTQ plus community, that um, in some congregations, there are homophobic beliefs and heterosexism, which is another form of a stressor for those young people. But the good news is that things are changing and people are particularly um, challenging traditional views of mental illness. There's less religious stigma associated with suicide. And particularly because people are, are better able to understand that mental health challenges are just that, that they are, uh, if you have a medical model, they are diseases like other diseases. If you have a behavioral health model, that they are problematic behaviors, just like people have problematic behaviors around other issues. And it's not a source of, of shame. And also that it's not a sign that you've done something bad or that you've been sinful or that you've done something that's not pleasing to the higher power. We also see that more and more clergy, particularly clergy who are educated in seminaries, are seeing that they are, have a role in mental health prevention where they're not the only provider for mental health challenges, but they are part of a team. And they're one of the many people who can help people towards wholeness and having uh, well-being, mental well-being. Oops, sorry about that. So we also have strong sense of community in faith communities. And I really see this with COVID-19. I think in my own church, even though we're not able to meet in person, we're actually meeting more frequently now because we're able to do it virtually. And so we have our services uh, on Zoom. We have, uh, I teach a stress management class on Tuesday evenings where we use mindfulness techniques. We have Bible study on Thursdays. We also in fact, we have Bible study tonight after this presentation. And we also have um, a book club every other week. And so there are lots of different ways that you can try to connect and develop that sense of connection and also of mattering. And you can matter in a church community in ways that you can't sometimes in the broader society. There are educational opportunities. So these are just pictures of workshops that we've had in my church. We are big, very big on um, environmental justice. And so we've had people from outside of the church family itself come in and talk to us about composting and recycling. We've had lots of educational um, workshops for children and adults around mental health challenges. I've done Bible study series on um, what does the Bible say about suicide? What does the Bible say about mental illness? I've done sermons about that um, as well. We also, what I really love about faith communities is that they are narratives of hope. And so regardless of what you're going through, there are ways that the faith can affirm your culture and your faith beliefs through stories that are built on how people have overcome adversity and find meaningful um, meaning in their hardships of life. This is uh, pictures of my church um, during Juneteenth. We were not able to come together to, um, to celebrate that in person the way we normally do. So we had an outdoor rally where we socially distanced. I love this picture. This is our youngest member who's just turning one years old and he's on his dad's shoulder and uh, he and his dad both have on Black Lives Matter t-shirts. This is me with my oldest granddaughter um, at the rally. This is our banner. So this is right outside our church. This is our church over here in the corner. This is my youngest daughter with the rainbow flag reminding us that not that Black Lives Matter, but all Black Lives Matter, including members of the LGBTQ. Um, community. And so our church is what's called an open and affirming church, which is a gay affirming um, and inclusive church. 
There's also each year there's um, the um, Faith Hope Life Campaign, which is comes out of the uh, National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention. And so there's a weekend every May, the third weekend in May, where we talk about Faith, Hope, and Light. There are tools that you can use to promote suicide prevention and, and help seeking behaviors. And we also participate in that every year. And so in conclusion, it does take a village, it takes all of us to work on this. And so hopefully people will consider one upstream approach is to do think of suicide prevention by partnering with faith communities. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really excellent talk. I have so many things that I want to say and talk to you about, um, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna move along for now to our next speaker, who is Dr. Hudson Mueller. Um, Dr. Hudson Mueller, feel free to take it away. Great. Um, well, thank you very much for uh, to the organizers for the invitation uh, to be part of this important uh, symposium. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, some research on uh, the relationship between stigma and suicide risk uh, in LGBT populations. So recent data from the Gallup Daily Tracking Poll uh, indicates that about 4.5% of the U.S. population currently identifies as a lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, or transgender LGBT. And that translates into about 15 million people here in the US, which is a little more than the population of Ohio. Um, there's also some recent data from the um, this same Gallup daily tracking poll indicating that um, the size of the LGBT population may be growing as people feel more comfortable identifying. Um, so for example, close to 8% or a little over 8% of millennials currently identify as LGBT. Uh, the Surgeon General and the National Institute of Health have classified LGBT people as a high-risk population for suicide, and that uh, conclusion is based on meta-analytic evidence on the magnitude of LGBT disparities in suicidality. Uh, so these are data from uh, a meta-analysis of 30 studies that examine the prevalence of lifetime suicidality uh, among LGBT and, and heterosexual populations. Uh, and this um, meta-analysis um, showed that data from population in, in population-based studies, about 4% of heterosexuals um, had attempted suicide in their lifetime compared um, to 11% of um, LGB-identified individuals. Uh, another really consistent finding in the literature is uh, that these disparities emerge early in the life course. Um, so these are some meta-analytic uh, data from um, school-based studies um, of youth, um, indicating that compared to their heterosexual peers, um, LGB youth had about a um, little over two times the odds of suicide um, thoughts and uh, intents and plans, uh, and about three times the odds of attempting a suicide. In addition, among those who had attempted suicide, um, LGB youth had about twice the odds of um, making an attempt that resulted in medical attention, um, which is a marker of severity. Uh, until really recently, uh, there had been no population-based data sets that had included measures of gender identity, and that really precluded our ability to understand the magnitude uh, of suicide risk among transgender populations. Uh, fortunately, that's beginning to change um, as some data sets are beginning to include these measures, uh, including um, some of the youth risk behavior surveillance data sets. Uh, and these are um, starting to indicate really striking uh, disparities. So you can see here um, that uh, about 35% of transgender youth had reported attempting suicide in the past year compared to only 7% of cisgender youth. So having uh, documented um, these disparities, the field has turned its attention to identifying causal mechanisms. Um, and one of the factors that's uh, received the most empirical attention in the literature is stigma. Um, which is uh, conceptualized in the literature as a multi-level construct ranging from individual to structural levels. Um, so briefly, individual forms of stigma refer to the psychological processes through which stigmatized individuals both perceive and react to stigma. So these can include things like anticipating rejection, um, becoming hypervigilant to threat cues in the environment, uh, or concealing aspects of your stigmatized identity if you're able uh, in order to avoid rejection and discrimination. Uh, in contrast, interpersonal forms of stigma refer to interactional processes that occur between the stigmatized and the non-stigmatized. Um, these can include really overt events like bias-based hate crimes, um, but they can also include more subtle interactional processes like microaggressions. And the vast majority of research uh, in the stigma literature has really focused at these two levels of analysis. Uh, but more recently, researchers have begun to uh, turn their attention to broader structural forms of stigma. Um, which my colleagues and I have defined as societal level conditions, cultural norms, and institutional policies and practices uh, that affect the lives of the stigmatized. 
So in the brief time that I have today, I'm just gonna walk through a couple of illustrative examples um, of research linking these different forms and levels of stigma to suicide risk among LGBT populations um, to give you uh, a sense of how researchers have approached this topic. So most suicide research uh, among LGBT populations is focused on stigma, the interpersonal level of analysis, uh, including how families react to uh, the disclosure of sexual orientation and gender expression, uh, either through support or rejection. Uh, so in one example, uh, Caitlin Ryan and her colleagues uh, assessed retrospective reports among LGB young adults uh, re regarding the frequency of parental uh, and caregiver reactions to their sexual orientation and gender expression. Uh, and then when they were teenagers and then examined associations between that and a variety of health risk indicators, including uh, suicide ideation and attempts. So you can see here on the um, far right hand side, um, this is the group reporting the highest levels of family rejection. Uh, and this group was uh, had about over five and a half times the odds of um, reporting suicide thoughts uh, in the last six months and they were um, had about eight times the odds of having made a lifetime suicide attempt as compared uh, to those who reported the lowest levels um, of family rejection. Uh, another interpersonal form of stigma um, that's been um, that's received a lot of focus in the literature is bullying, which is uh, another common experience among LGBT youth. Um, so in a recent uh, innovative study, my colleague Kirsty um, Clark examined whether bullying is a more common antecedent among LGBT youth who die by suicide uh, using postmortem records from uh, the National Violent Death Reporting System. So in this study, she classified deaths as associated with bullying if the decedent um, self-reported being bullied, for example, uh, in a suicide note, or if witnesses uh, reported that the decedent was bullied, or finally, uh, if post-mortem investigations revealed uh, the bullying had occurred, for example, through examination of um, text messages. So this figure shows the results depicting the prevalence of bullying as an antecedent to suicide. So on the y-axis here is the prevalence of bullying among decedents and on the x-axis is the age of death at years. Uh, and so in the total sample uh, about um, the prevalence of bullying among decedents was about 5%, but was over 20% among the LGBT classified group. Uh, and in addition, LGBT classified death records um, evidenced about five times the odds of being bullied uh, compared to non-LGBT classified death records. So um, while these two studies have focused on stigma at the interpersonal uh, level of analysis, a more recent line of work has uh, examined uh, structural forms of stigma. And I'll present just uh, two brief examples of this work. Um, so in one uh, methodological approach, researchers have capitalized on the rapidly changing policy environment surrounding LGBT populations here in the US, um, which uh, provides uh, unique opportunities to conduct quasi or natural experiments. And one of the advantages uh, of these quasi experiments is that they represent exogenous events that occur outside the control of individuals um, and therefore uh, minimize threats to validity of self-selection um, into the intervention group. Um, one of the um, examples of this is um, done by uh, Dr. Julie Raithman and her colleagues. Um, she's a panelist today, um, where they use this quasi-experimental approach to examine uh, associations between um, state same-sex marriage policies and adolescent suicide attempts. So in this study, they used um, difference of difference analyses. This is an econometrics approach uh, that enabled them to compare changes in suicide attempts among public high school students before and after the implementation of state policies in 32 states that had permitted same-sex marriage uh, and compared those to the 15 states that, um, had not, that did not have these policies. And their um, outcome data on suicide attempts and data on sexual orientation come from the youth risk behavior surveillance system data sets, which are um, population-based studies of school-based youth. So this figure shows um, trends in suicide attempts in the years um, before the implementation of same-sex marriage policies stratified by states that ultimately went on to pass on these laws uh, versus states that didn't. And um, this analysis indicated that there were no pre-existing differences in trends in suicide attempts uh, between states that ultimately pass these same-sex marriage policies versus control states. Um, and that was important because it, um, made, it, it enabled them to be more confident that any observed changes uh, in suicide attempts that occurred after the um, implementation of these policies was not due to pre-existing differences uh, in suicide attempts between these two states. So this table depicts the main um, findings in this study. 
So after uh, the uh, same-sex marriage laws were implemented, the proportion of sexual minority youth reporting um, past year suicide attempts decreased by four percentage points. And that was equivalent to about a 14% uh, relative decline uh, in the proportion of sexual minority youth uh, reporting past year suicide attempts in those states. Uh, and importantly, um, Dr. Rickman and her colleagues also use state fixed effects in these analyses, and that does two things. Um, first, it controls for baseline differences in rates of uh, uh, suicide attempts across states. And secondly, controls for time invariant characteristics, um, for, like for example, political uh, environments that could theoretically influence uh, both the implementation of these laws uh, and also mental health outcomes. So in a second uh, example of the, the structural approach, uh, researchers have capitalized on uh, divergent mobility patterns that uh, naturally occur in, in um, studies to examine life course variations in structural stigma exposure. Um, like for example, that can happen when uh, stigmatized individuals move from a stigmatizing environment to uh, uh, environments with high levels of structural stigma uh, and move to uh, lower uh, structural stigma environments. And this approach has been used um, by one of my colleagues, John Pachinkas, uh, in a newly released um, large data set uh, in Europe uh, of gay and bisexual and other men who have sex with men. And this data set includes participants who were born in 179 different countries and 12,000 of whom had moved from higher to lower structural stigma context. And so this, um, uh, uh, data structure provided a really unique opportunity to exa examine whether among those who moved, longer exposure to lower levels of structural stigma in their receiving country uh, was associated with reduced risk of um, suicide, um, suicide attempts. So here the data on the y-axis is the um, uh, country level prevalence of suicidality and on the x-axis is the country uh, level structural stigma. This was a variable that we created a composite index of um, a variety of different laws and policies related to sexual orientation at the country level and also aggregated social norms and attitudes uh, related to homosexuality. And these results are stratified among those who moved uh, from high to low structural stigma uh, countries during childhood or adolescence uh, and comparing those uh, who moved during adulthood. Um, so here are the results on the, um, the orange group here are those who moved uh, during adulthood. And you can see that uh, country level um, structural stigma was associated with suicidality only for these respondents. Um, so this was the group who was uh, exposed to higher levels of structural stigma in their country of origin um, for much of development. In contrast, there's no association between country of origin, structural stigma, and suicidality among those who moved um, during childhood and adolescence shown in the um, flat blue line here. Um, so let me end with some um, brief remarks uh, about the intervention implications uh, given some of this research. Um, so if, as you've uh, seen, uh, stigma is a multi-level construct uh, and thus reducing some of the negative mental health consequences of stigma requires a multi-pronged approach um, that targets and addresses um, stigma at each level of analysis. So this includes uh, individual level uh, interventions such as those developed by my colleague, John Pachankas that focuses on promoting adaptive coping uh, and and uh, resilience in the face of um, high structural stigma environments. This also includes uh, family level interventions um, that help diverse families support their LGBT children, um, such as some of the work that Caitlin Ryan and her group does on the uh, Family Acceptance Project. And then finally, at the structural level, this also includes structural level interventions, including uh, laws and policies, which research indicates plays a causal role uh, in the reduction of uh, anti-gay bias. Um, so I'll end there and um, look forward to uh, your questions in our conversation during the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you so much for another really excellent um, talk. A lot of things to think about. I'm excited to speak about them later. Um, so now we'll move on to Dr. Wexler. Let me unmute and share my screen. So these are great talks and I have so many questions and notes and I will try and link as much as I can. So my name is Lisa Wexler and I like to start, oops, um, let's see. I like to start um, by telling you a little bit about what I'm gonna say in the next 10 to 15 minutes and I'm putting the timer on because I wanna be able to hear from everybody here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I came to this work. Um, I am a white, 
Jewish woman who grew up in Florida, and yet I'm going to be talking to you about lessons learned from the Arctic. And I want to contextualize some of what I'm talking about to, to give you a sense of how it can be generalizable to other populations. So I'm going to talk about the scope of suicide in the US in general and globally, and how we as a country have really looked at solutions for it. And I'm going to make a case for some upstream multi-level prevention um, possibilities. And then I'm going to give you one example of what we've done in Northwest Arctic um, to put that into practice and give you some, some early results from that work. So it's a lot to do in like 10 minutes, but we're going to try. So to give you some sense of who I am, um, I've been working in rural and remote Alaska for decades now. Um, as a newly minted social worker, I was a counselor in Northwest Alaska and really had maybe a couple hours of suicide training um, to do that work to begin with. And was really coming up against a lot of um, crises. I was being called a lot as a very young, new woman who didn't really know very much about how families worked, how people talked about distress. Um, and I was being called in people's really dark moments um, to decide whether someone was at high risk or not. Um, if I thought they might be um, at high risk for suicide, we would literally call the troopers and bring them into a central location where someone like me could look at them in a really um, sort of sterile hospital-like environment that was quote unquote safe, um, where I would try and determine how scary the situation really was. Um, and my, my options were either at the end of a 24 to 48 hour hold, could decide to send them back home and there are very little resources um, as far as mental health care um, where I would be sending them or sort of supervision and that sort of thing from the clinical sense, from the formal systems. Um, and again, had very few relationships in the informal helping systems at the time, or I could send them 500 plus air miles away um, to be seen by someone even farther from where they lived in all kinds of ways um, to determine how high risk they were. So Sherry talked about, or Dr. Mullick talked about how important context is, and I can't stress enough how bewildering the situation was to be put into um, a decision-making responsible role without enough understanding of what was happening. And sometimes I really do believe I was doing damage by taking people away from strengths and from people and from cultural resources that could really help bolster them through really hard times. So that really put me on a pathway to really try and figure out if we could design better systems that could help um, prevent suicide um, and promote health. So that's the path that I've been on since 1995. Um, and we have developed many things. And I think um, one of the ones that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is a multi-level um, process that we do that, that really thinks about suicide prevention as community mobilization. So really how can we try and garnish and support the community level um, support systems for young people in a multitude of ways on multiple levels um, that can really help them imagine a future they wanna walk into. So really thinking about um, the capacity to aspire. I love that idea by a Potterai who really talks about how suicide prevention is sort of embedded in this idea of future. And we really need to reconceptualize how we design futures for people. And if we can make enough room, so to go back to the housing and the structural issues, how, how we can create futures people are excited to walk into. So now I wanna really back up and, and look at the scope of suicide in the US right now, because I think the region that I, that I just shared about with you today does have very high, high rates of suicide, but suicide rates in the US and globally are rising. And it really is a top 10 um, sort of issue in the United States as far as you know, what, is, um, what is a health issue. And for young people particularly, it's a leading cause of death. Um, so it's, it's you know, it globally, the second leading cause of death for young people. And in some areas, like where I work, it can be the first leading cause of death for um, young people 
um, within the 15 to 29 age range. We've seen a rise in the last 20 years and particularly a rise in rural areas where there's less access to mental health care, which I'm gonna just underscore in a little bit um, to talk about why that might be a problem. I also wanna point out that firearms are the most common method for suicide fatalities. And we often think about firearms only in homicides instead of suicides when more people die from suicide by firearm. Um, and then the last thing I really wanna highlight is that most people that die by suicide do not have a mental health condition. And I think most people are surprised by that. And that's partly because we put such a great focus on clinical care in the United States when we thought about suicide. Um, the, the, the part one of this series really sort of highlighted both of these points is that we try and shrink suicide down to a psychological condition that lives inside people's heads. And, and as we've heard, there are structural issues, there are sort of housing issues, there are employment issues. There's so many things outside of that person's psychological problem um, that impact their ideas about what's possible for them in the future. And expanding that could do a great deal for expanding out the tools that we have for suicide prevention. Um, so really want to push us to think about that. I also want to really push us to think about how many resources have been focused on identifying risks and really trying to identify proximal risks and We've done a poor job of that. We don't have good assessments that look at the near-term risk for suicide. We have really good assessments that look at the lifetime risk of suicide, but in a clinical care situation, that lifetime risk is much less important. Um, we also know that many people that die by suicide do it impulsively, meaning less than an hour, less than 10 minutes to even actually um, get that lethal mean. So really important to think about that. Um, and that our mental health system is not well equipped to handle suicide. We don't give a lot of training. We don't even require a lot of training um, in our mental health um, workforce. And that really limits what, what we can do for, for suicide prevention if we're putting all of those, all of our prevention eggs in that basket, if you will. We really need to expand out and think more creatively about what can be done to prevent suicide. So maybe this is like hopefully hitting the, the point home here, but instead of really looking for those risk factors and those um, proximal um, signals of risk, we're kind of looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, and we've not done a great job. And um, as the Dean mentioned at the beginning, we have not been able to reduce suicide rates at a population level yet in this country, and those rates are rising. And I'm trying to make a case for this one dimensional approach that's trying to identify people at high risk for suicide is a needle in a haystack that's not gonna get us as far as we need to go for this. I'm gonna give you one example um, that I know well. So this is from Northwest Alaska, um, where I've worked for decades now. Um, and I want to just show sort of how some of these gaps in our current system of care are. And I just want to say that the people on the front lines of this, this is not a statement about their, um, their, capa their capabilities. It's really about the systems of care that we have funded and supported for this work. So in the region that I work, and this actually mirrors a lot of what we know about suicide globally, um, predominantly young people are dying by suicide. Um, Many of them show depression, stress, some triggering event like breaking up, having relationship problems. Um, alcohol or drug misuse is associated with the actual um, suicidal behavior. Many people are school leavers, the majority are. Um, and we, are, we do find associations between suicide deaths and unintentionally, unintentional alcohol-related injury. Um, we also know that people around the person notice something is off. It, it, it's unclear what it is necessarily. If it was clearly a suicide warning sign in that way, they would do something. But in many um, instances, um, they notice something and after the deed is done, um, they can sort of place it. Um, so the mental health system here is being used mostly as a crisis response. So when we think about, um, you know, identifying people at high risk in the regions that I work, 
75% of the re referrals to mental health, and I mentioned as a brand new social worker, these were the calls I was getting, um, require admittance. So it's scary enough, it's crisis enough that um, the clinician is recommending that that person is admitted to the hospital. So that's a very expensive um, process. It's also could be really traumatic for the people and the, the families that are experiencing that because they lose control. And we have a long history of taking control from marginalized people and having our healthcare systems not really be designed for them or for supporting their needs. So when you have someone take your child in a plane you know, many air miles away to sort of do medical treatments to them, that can be really scary for people, not only the person who is feeling suicidal, but also their family members. Um, if, as I said, we don't have great assessments, but if we, we sort of say that it's not imminent risk, they're sent back home because we don't have many intermediate care. If we consider them still at high risk, we send them to inpatient far away. And that can do some, all kinds of damage. I've written about that in lots of different ways. Um, and really our suicide outcomes are quite poor. So if we think about our mental health system, 82% um, of the people in this region that die by suicide are not receiving or refuse to receive mental health care and half of the people who attempt suicide the same. So, so really what we need to do is to think about a more upstream model. We need to think about moving risk by increasing safety and promoting health within people's everyday lives. And we need to have many more pathways to care, many more pathways to support, many more pathways to mattering, as Dr. Malik mentioned earlier. And we also need to build on what works. Um, when we think about the kinds of prevention that's funded in this country, we don't necessarily fund the things that work the best most often. So I'm gonna just bring up lethal means restriction. Again, if you can make it harder to get a lethal means, if you can make that um, those guns harder to get access to when you're feeling that impulse, you can save lives. Many people do not go on to die by suicide. Um, even if they had that impulse. There's some evidence that non-demanding support, non support from caring others makes a big difference. Having positive adult interactions, um, really helpful. Um, cultural engagement that's particularly for people that have been marginalized in the past. So having something that, that helps with the identity work that, that sort of um, pushes up against some of those intersecting multi-level stigmas that happen for a multitude of reasons, GLBT as we just heard, but also racial um, and ethnic and a whole bunch of other ways in which we have intersecting marginalities in this country. Um, and we really need to be thinking about postvention and how we can help people do a better job of thinking if they do know somebody that has died by suicide, they are at increased risk and we can be doing things to help schools, to help families know how to better um, respond to those folks. And we need to find ways to bring research to practice. Um, 80% of the evidence-based um, interventions that have been developed um, in this country are never used in practice for a number of reasons, partly because many times they're really expensive or they're hard to do, or the fidelity that we um, consider really important um, isn't able to be achieved in low resourced settings or in culturally diverse settings. And so we have developed a way to try and translate research to self-determined practice. And I think that is a really important thing. So we want to acknowledge and highlight and support um, people's local and cultural knowledge bases. Um, and we want to give information from scientific research that might be useful to them and give them a chance to sort of think about it, to apply it to their lives, to talk with others about it, to create a community to take action or not depending on their own social role, their own meaning systems, their own sense of um, priorities. And so we have a train the trainer model where we train folks in communities to bring together groups of folks, pastors, we talked about the importance of that, policymakers, tribal policymakers, school personnel, lots of different people in the lives of young people to learn a little bit about research. We keep that to less than 10 minutes. That's my 
that's my time, um, to talk about how to apply it and to decide how they wanna use it in their lives and work. We've been able to show outcomes from that in a whole bunch of ways, particularly in behavioral outcomes. So people are more likely to do preventative behaviors when they've gone to these learning circles. And most impressively, I think, um, we've been able to show the people that are close to folks that are attending the PC Cares learning circles are also more likely to increase their prevention behavior. So really trying to engage the social systems, the informal supporters, as well as the formal supporters in doing um, as much preventative behavior as they can. And that is my team. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wexler. You actually brought up a bunch of things that I'm hoping to talk about during the discussion. That was really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll turn to Dr. Natalie Riblett. So I will um, pull up my slides. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about suicide risk during care transition scenarios, um, which actually I think uh, ties in well with um, what Lisa just discussed. Um, so just briefly, I'm supported by um, some grants from the VA, so through the Office of Rural Health, um, through Clinical Science Research and Development Career Development Award, and through the VA National Center for Patient Safety. Um, so the first thing that I want to highlight is that um, what we know is that the risk for suicide is actually particularly high after an inpatient mental health discharge. Um, so, for example, in a meta-analysis that was done by Chung et al. in 2019, they actually found that the suicide rate per 100,000 person years was 2,950 suicides in the first week after discharge and 2,060 suicides in the first month after discharge. And to put this in context, this is about 100 times, over 100 times that of the um, suicide rate of the general US population. And similarly, there's also a high risk within the first um, three months after hospitalization. Um, and there's also been some work that suggested that even when patients um, are admitted with mental health conditions, in particular suicidal behavior to non-mental health settings, so for example, being admitted to a medical surgical unit, that they are also at high risk um, for suicide after discharge. Um, and the same thing holds true when you look at patients who are discharged from an emergency room setting. And these um, findings, um, people believe that some of the reasons why um, patients might be at particularly high risk for suicide um, during these types of care transitions may relate to three important factors. So one is poor treatment engagement, and that may be both because of access issues, but also on part of the patient that maybe um, they don't have the motivation or the interest necessarily in remaining engaged in treatment. Um, there also may be fragmented care so that um, there are problems with handoffs between when the patient leaves the hospital and when they actually are able to connect with their outpatient providers. And then the final item may relate to poor social connectedness so that patients um, for a variety of different reasons, one may also be including stigma, that they um, may not be able to sort of get adequate support um, from others in their community to help them. Um, and there have been in the literature, a number of different sort of approaches that have been studied um, to try to address this problem of suicide risk post-discharge. Um, some of these interventions sort of target um, what happens to patients during the hospital or emergency room admission. So for example, there have been a number of different psychotherapies that have been tested. Um, and some of these include also sort of a follow-up strategy. There's also some uh, peer support interventions that are being looked at, um, as well as um, safety planning. Um, is something that has been um, well studied and, and there's a lot of evidence to support safety planning and actually safety planning in the United States at least is really considered standard of care at this point. Um, then there are also some interventions that sort of target what happens to the patient around the time of discharge and immediately in the period following discharge. Um, and this may include education, it may include treatment planning, 
and it may also include some element of active outreach and sort of case management. And then um, there, finally, in sort of the post-discharge period, other strategies that, that have been tested include um, brief interventions that maybe require less um, hands-on involvement with the patient, but may include things like postcards. And some of these postcards are now actually um, developed into text messages so that basically patients um, get text messages that remind them that someone cares about them and is thinking about them and is reaching out to them to sort of determine whether or not they need more um, help and support. And so a couple of years ago, uh, my colleague, Dr. Shiner, and I, we conducted a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials that studied various suicide prevention strategies, um, and specifically, we're interested in um, the impact of these strategies on death by suicide. And we ended up identifying um, 72 randomized controlled trials that included um, suicide as, as one of their outcomes, not necessarily their, their primary outcome, but as one of their outcomes. And in that meta-analysis, we identified an intervention called the um, WHO Brief Intervention and Contact Program that prevented death by suicide in patients who were treated in acute setting after a suicide attempt. And the who, so I'm gonna to refer to this as the HUBEC. So the HUBEC, um, basically, the goals of the program are to enhance treatment engagement, to help build self-efficacy, and to increase the patient's sense of social support and connectedness after discharge. And it does this basically through educating the patient about suicide risk prior to discharge by including some aspects of motivational interviewing and providing the patient with professional support for 18 months after discharge. Um, and the staffing for it typically can be done by like a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or a nurse. So it, it has to be someone who has mental health training, but it but it may be they may come from a variety of different uh, backgrounds. And so the um, Hubeck findings I, um, are quite interesting, especially given the impact on death by suicide. But there are some important limitations um, to this intervention. Um, so first of all, it's only been studied in low and middle income countries, um, and it was focused specifically on patients who had made a recent suicide attempt. Um, the original trials also didn't explore sort of the mechanism of action to understand why the HUBIC might be useful. Um, and the intervention, um, as it was originally designed, was not uh, manualized, um, so that could potentially limit uh, the scalability and spread of the intervention. And so we have worked um, with one of the methodologists from the HUBEC to develop something called the VABIC, which is the Veterans Affairs Brief Intervention and Contact Program, which is essentially an adaptation of the HUBEC. It's manualized. It includes elements that are specific to our veteran population. So the education is tailored to veterans and we also have added safety planning since that's um, standard of care in the United States. And uh, we shortened the intervention from 18 months to three months um, in terms of um, being realistic about the scalability of such an intervention. And the results of our pilot work have actually suggested um, that this strategy might meet the unique needs of US veterans, that it may be feasible, and that VA mental health providers um, from or at least our pilot work suggests that, that the VA BIC seems like it um, may be both promising but also actually meet their needs as well. And we've done some pilot work um, which suggests that the VA BIC may improve um, some measures of suicide risk following discharge with the greatest benefit possibly being in the first uh, month after discharge. And so now um, we're working on um, building an enhanced version of the VA BIC that would be studied in a randomized trial in a veteran population um, where I work, which is at the White River Junction VA in Vermont. And then um, we are also looking to see whether this intervention could be used in other high-risk transition scenarios, such as patients who leave an emergency room or patients who are discharged from 
residential treatment programs. Um, and then the HUBIC methodologist, Dr. Wasserman, who I've worked with is separately looking at potentially doing an um, updated version of the HUBIC in a trial that would um, happen um, internationally in a number of different countries. Um, and that's it. So I will uh, pass it on to Julia. Thank you, Dr. Riblett. Excellent. I'm looking forward to speaking more about that later as well about your work. Um, so now Dr. Julia Raifman. Hi, thank you so much for having me. And, and it is such an honor to present alongside people who I so admire and, and whose work has really laid the foundation for my own. Uh, today, I'll be discussing policy approaches to suicide prevention. And as our last speaker, I wanted to highlight several of the most important points that the prior speakers in this symposium have made. Uh, so Dr. Barnhorst started us off with this chart and I wanted to return to it now, just highlighting uh, that suicide is a leading cause of premature death in the United States. And that uh, we see that in particular for people aged 10 to 34, suicide is the second leading cause of death. Uh, and it leads to uh, people dying who would otherwise live decades longer. Dr. Gordon highlighted that suicide is increasing over time. Uh, here we see that that's true for people overall. Uh, that the suicide rate has increased for the last 10 years for which we have data and that that's particularly true for young people aged 15 to 34 depicted in green. This is all prior to the COVID-19 context and I'm very concerned about what's going to happen in the context of the COVID-19 crisis that social isolation uh, and economic distress that people are experiencing and I'll return to that later in the presentation. The prior speakers have brought up several strategies that are effective for reducing suicide. Uh, Drs. Barnhorst and Stuber have really highlighted the importance of firearms as a means of suicide in the United States uh, and the importance of means restriction and firearm safety for reducing suicide. Uh, Drs. Moloch, Walker, Hatton, Bueller, and Lipson all highlighted how marginalization, particularly through structural racism and structural stigma, drives suicidality. Um, and today, Dr. Wexler, and uh, as well as Dr. Moloch, really highlighted the importance of economic opportunities for preventing suicide. I'm going to focus on policies as an approach to delivering suicide interventions at scale uh, that reach uh, millions of people at a time. I also distinguish here that we can focus on policies that prevent suicide, which means restriction does very effectively. We can also distinguish between those and policies that prevent both suicide and mental distress, which is worth preventing in itself. So first on preventing suicide, I uh, just speak to the universality of uh, means restriction and, and how effective it is for preventing suicide. I actually thought I would start us out in Sri Lanka before returning to the United States. Um, so in Sri Lanka, this figure depicts the suicide rate over time uh, and by means. Uh, and what you can see is that pesticides were the leading cause, this top uh, line here, uh, were the leading cause of suicide in Sri Lanka. And that in 1995, Sri Lanka banned all class one pesticides and in 1998, they banned an additional pesticide. Uh, and the authors of this paper find that there were an estimated 20,000 fewer deaths in Sri Lanka in the 10 years after the policy banning the pesticide. We see similar evidence on firearms in the United States. Um, so for instance, Dr. Krafasi and colleagues found that permit to purchase policies were associated with a 15 to 16% reduction in firearm suicide rates. We studied uh, the age of handgun purchase policies. Um, so in the wake of the Parkland shooting and the advocacy of the, of the students who were affected by that shooting, there were three states that increased the age of handgun purchase from 18 to 21. And in this manuscript, we looked at uh, the age pattern of suicide rates uh, in, this, in the states that changed their policies prior to the, uh, the states that did so most recently, so um, between 2000 and, and 2015. Uh, and we found that when states had age 18 handgun purchase policies, that suicide rates among those age 18 to 20 were much higher than in the period when states had age 21 handgun policies. Next, I'll talk about policies of marginalization and demarginalization. 
Uh, Dr. Hatson Bueller very nicely described our study indicating that state same sex marriage policies were associated with a 7% reduction in adolescent suicide attempts. There are also policies that do the inverse. There are policies um, in several states that uh, explicitly ban LGBT people from having equal rights, whether that's to participation in school groups or to visiting businesses uh, or to accessing mental health care. Uh, and we found, uh, unsurprisingly, that these, uh, these policies were associated with a 46% increase in mental distress among LGB people, whereas they were not associated with any change in mental distress in the comparison groups. My colleagues, Drs. Gore and Venkataramani, have done research on police killings and mental health and found that each police killing of an unarmed Black American was associated with 0.14 additional poor mental health days among Black persons. And I'll highlight that there's a uh, really important need for further research on how structural racism drives uh, health disparities and uh, particularly related to suicide and mental health. Finally, I'll turn to economic opportunities. My colleague Paul Schaefer was involved in this study indicating that a $1 increase in the state minimum wage was associated with a 1.9% decrease in the overall state suicide rate. Uh, and other researchers have found that this was particularly concentrated among um, people who had lower levels of education. We see similar evidence for the earned income tax credit, which was associated with a reduction in suicide, particularly among people with an educational attainment of, of high school or less. So this brings us to the COVID-19 context where we are experienced a pro experiencing a prolonged period of um, infectious disease risk, um, the reality of infectious disease illness and bereavement, uh, as well as uh, an economic disaster and very high rates of unemployment and the housing and food insecurity that accompany that. I, it wouldn't surprise anyone, I think, but it's still very concerning to, to know that suicidal ideation has increased during this period. Um, we recently looked at data that were nationally representative from the 2017-2018 wave of the NHANES and compared that to more recent nationally representative data since the COVID-19 pandemic began. And we found that there was an increase in suicidal ideation from 3.4% before the pandemic to 16.3% during the COVID-19 pandemic overall. And in this figure, you can see that that um, increase in suicidal ideation is really concentrated more so among people who are living in low-income households. So here, more than a quarter of people who are living in households with less than $20,000 in earnings reported suicidal ideation in the past two weeks. Suicidal ideation was even higher among people who in particular reported having difficulty paying rent, among whom 32% reported suicidal ideation. This is driven by unemployment in low-income households. Uh, uh, people have lost their jobs during the COVID-19 pandemic through no fault of their own. And you can see that that has really been concentrated among people in the lowest earning households. Uh, employment did not decline as much and has largely recovered among people living in higher income households, uh, but unemployment remains really high among people in low income households. This has led to realities like this one. This is an eviction that occurred in Colorado earlier this month. This is a family uh, that is being forced out of their home. And I don't know about you, but if this happened to me today, I don't know where I would go to keep my family safe. And unfortunately, this is a situation that is facing 32% of Americans uh, based on the most recent census pulse survey data collected also earlier this month. Uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, we are about to have our eviction moratorium end and have this happen on a widespread scale across our state. We do have evidence of things that can help people in these circumstances. We have evidence uh, from uh, prior research indicating that greater maximum unemployment insurance benefits were associated with a lower suicide rate. And, and that was with respect to the maximum duration of the unemployment insurance and the maximum amount of unemployment insurance. 
Um, and thanks to my research fellow, Will Raderman, I, I have learned that the United States has some of the least generous unemployment insurance in the world. And so expanding that unemployment insurance during a period of crisis would be a reasonable thing to do. So there are several policy approaches we could take to preventing suicide during this time of crisis. At the federal level, uh, the federal government is really the only uh, actor that has the capacity to take on debt and to fund stimulus payments and to fund expanded unemployment insurance amount and duration. At the state level, there are really important steps that states can take, such as eviction moratoriums and renter relief, like Massachusetts has done in the past, but is set to end. Uh, we have tracked state policy responses to COVID-19 and the economic crisis so that people conduct, can conduct research on how these policies are shaping population health, including uh, suicide as, as well as health disparities. And we have started to look into how eviction moratoriums are affecting mental health and, uh, and uh, they do seem to be protective of mental health, particularly for people in low income households. Also highlight that means restriction remains really important, particularly in this context of elevated suicidal ideation, uh, that uh, policies that uh, help people uh, keep their firearms safely stored um, and that uh, prevent people from um, having firearms in the, the household as often are, will be associated with whether people take their lives during this time. Finally, policymakers I, are the people who make policies and who decide whether the policies that I've listed and several others that affect suicide uh, will be put into place. And so uh, all of us have a role to play in electing policymakers on November 3rd um, and choosing policymakers who we think will help our country and help our state. I just wanted to end uh, returning to, um, to the eviction situation that Massachusetts um, plans to end its eviction moratorium in two days and has actually hired additional judges to, um, to carry out these evictions more quickly. So this is an eviction that took place also in Colorado uh, earlier this month. And just as the temperature is dropping in Massachusetts and the COVID cases are climbing in Massachusetts, there are families that are going to have um, going to be find themselves on the street uh, and to me this is something um, I think uh, really worries me in, in terms of how it's going to affect people's mental health um, and that I personally would find very distressing. So I wanted to provide here a link to um, where you can look up your legislator if this is something that you care about and that worries you um, and you can reach out to them and I will say that when I've reached out to them I've heard that there are a lot of people calling and so I hope that people take heart in that Although we can't see each other right now, um, there are a lot of people who care about each other in the community uh, and who are calling their legislators trying to help their neighbors and their community members. Thank you. Thank you to uh, all of you in the audience. Thank you to uh, everyone who coordinated the seminar series and to my funders. And I look forward to any questions. Thank you very much, Julia, for really excellent presentation. Thank you to all of the speakers um, for excellent presentations. I have some sort of big picture thoughts and questions, but we also have a bunch of questions in the chat, so I might save them. Um, I do think it's really interesting how throughout the presentations there has been this focus on structural and systemic forces that lead to suicide risk, um, and that's something that's not I think gotten quite the attention as the clinical and individual factors have as Dr. Wexler mentioned. So let's put a pause on that for a second and go to some audience questions to make sure that we have a chance to get to those and we can come back to maybe a big picture question at the end if we have some time. Um, so I believe the first question I saw in the chat was for Dr. Malik. How do you suggest we identify which religious and spiritual spaces are more progressive on suicide? What kinds of collaborations would you like to see from public health professionals within religious spaces? Wow. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> so um, one of the things I talk about a lot when we're talking about partnering with faith communities is don't, don't. You, don't, you can partner with, with um, faith communities that are also very traditional. I think you have to meet people where they are. You have to think about what kinds of interventions can you do given their doctrine and their theology. And I think one of the mistakes that researchers make or um, and sometimes even clinicians is going in and deciding for the faith community what their doctrine and theology should be. And so the point of intervention is not to change doctrine and theology, they'll be kicked out. <laughs> 
It's also, in my opinion, it's arrogant and disrespectful. So I think a better, a, a different approach might be to say, what are what are the intervention techniques and strategies, prevention strategies that, given this church where they are now, what approaches can are palatable for them, and what are the ones that you can integrate into what they're already doing? So, for example, for suicide risk, there in our research, and we've been doing a lot of qualitative research. The prohibition against suicide, at least in black churches, is not actually that strong. What the stronger prohibition is culture. So the resistance is not so much, it's a sin. The resistance is we don't do this. So until and suicide is a relatively rare behavior. So churches can go years and not know of a suicide. So it's it's more real to people when there's a crisis there. So I think that just meeting with people and developing the prevention together being respectful of what that church's theology is, their doctrine, what they are prepared to do, what they're not prepared to do. Um, we just looked at some data. We're also trying to develop an HIV prevention program. There's a wide range of what people are willing to do. And so rather than say we have a, a prevention that one size fits all, we're going to tailor the preventions to what people feel comfortable doing. And we don't know. I mean, my church started as an open and affirming church, but trust me when I say not all members of my church felt that way. In fact, very few of them did. <laughs> so we did lots and lots of teachings. I do a ser an eight week series on sexuality in the black church. And it's through those teachings of not telling people to change, just saying, this is some information for you so that you can be fully informed to decide what you think about homosexuality, if it's a sin or not. And you'd be amazed people have changed, not because we force them to change, but we respect their position and the respect that, that they have, they're entitled to their position, but to say there's other ways of looking at this as well. And, and I've done the same thing with suicide. So I think that's important. I think partnering with public health officials is really important. I think you'd be shocked that a lot of churches are hungry for this information and for partnerships. I think more and more churches are realizing they can't be one stop all shoppers for their, for their um, congregation members that they don't have the time and the resources to do it. And, the, and I think if people enter it into a true partnership, which means doesn't mean developing the prevention and then bringing it to them, but letting them help you develop the prevention from the beginning, I think goes a long way. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Um, I might direct this next question to Dr. Hatzenbuehler. Um, this person is curious about preteen risk and treatment. So even in Massachusetts, it's challenging to get a psych bed inpatient hospitalization for a suicidal child. Can we talk about best cases, policies, treatment centers in the US and where Massachusetts stands on policy and intervention? Um, if time permits, you could also speak about um, the best parent family resource wraparound service models in the US. I am unfortunately probably not the best person to answer that question. I may put to my other colleagues on here who are suicide experts or who know, I just moved to Massachusetts about a month ago. So uh -huh. I'm not up to date on all the, um, on the situation here at the state level. So maybe someone who um, might know more about it. Julia Rafen might know more about it, but you're on mute. Unfortunately, I don't know. I don't know much about it either. Um, I let's say I don't know who on here would know. Yes, I am not sure either. So this may be a question that we could um, potentially follow up on at another time um, and get a little more information about it, um, and then get back to the question asker. <laughs> um, so why don't I turn then to Dr. Wexler. Um, as you said, lethal means restriction is very important for suicide prevention, especially firearms. However, in some indigenous communities, restricting access to firearms is limited due to cultural practices. Firearm not being considered a weapon, but a tool to practice land-based activities. What would you recommend as strategies to cultural adapt lethal means restriction? I love that question. In fact, we were just talking about that. Um, because we just, um, NIMH just funded a new project that we have that's really trying to build on the family strengths in indigenous communities. And the way that we're going about it, um, because it's absolutely true. So firearms are sort of connected to a lot of values and priorities for pretty much everyone. Um, but in indigenous communities where there's a lot of distrust of sort of governmental, all sorts of things and for really, really good reasons, um, and with subsistence or um, sort of gathering food really associated with firearms and the ability to feed yourself and to feed your family and to take care of elders and 
um, it's really, really important to be thinking about safety and to reframing it. I, reframing instead of like limiting people's access to guns, really trying to keep your home safer and really trying to protect the people in your, your life so that they you know, can live long lives. So we've been trying to sort of reframe it as safety and protection and caring about each other and doing that in a good way. Um, but we are taking a lot of cues from our community partners, going back to what Sherry was saying with like planning with them. And so our family safety net intervention is really trying to engage all sorts of people that have young people in their homes and in their lives to be thinking about safety and how they can increase that for the young people there. Thank you. We have another question that I'll direct towards Dr. Riblet um, that's veteran specific, a question on weaponry. When dealing with veterans, how do you eliminate the lethality of objects at home? So I think again, um, it relates mostly to sort of working with the patient and hopefully educating them more about those risks and maybe even getting family involved in terms of finding ways to um, at least temporarily when they're in sort of a setting of acute distress, potentially having um, another family hold, family member hold that weapon or, or find some other creative ways to get it out of their home because it is definitely, especially in the veteran population where many veterans have weapons and they also, again, for cultural reasons, have other connections to their weapons outside of um, wanting to use it to hurt themselves, but it, that I think working with them rather than trying to work against them and is useful. Thank you for that. And I'll actually direct a second question to you. Um, what are your thoughts on universal screening during annual primary care visits or ER visits? I know that you're a psychiatrist. <laughs> um, so that is, that is a great question. I think it's a complicated question um, in terms of whether or not the evidence is strong enough to support that universal screening is useful. And I think that as far as I know, at least the evidence is still not completely there to support that. Excellent, thank you. And um, we have another question actually back to Dr. Wexler. For culturally diverse groups, how do you think ethnic and cultural practices protect or enhance suicide risk, especially in very tight-knit collectivist communities? Well, that's an easy one. <laughs> it's one of those lessons that I learn over and over again in the depth and the ways in which um, culture and identity and history and you know family and generations and um, and land and land-based activities, all of those things for everyone really um, are really important. It's just that the dominant culture shapes it in a very particular way for a very particular understanding of what those things are and how they should be sort of addressed in everyday life. And so, um, you know, there's a lot, it, there's so much research, particularly qualitative research that really focuses on culture as protection um, or as health promoting or as wellness. Um, and we hear that over and over and over again. So I think that that was an easy one. Excellent, thank you. Um, I may end before we turn things back to Dean Galea with just my big picture sort of question for anyone on the panel that would like to speak to this. Um, but from where I sit as a person who does epidemiologic suicide research, it seems like a lot of the focus of prevention has been on identifying individual clinic-based risk factors and constellation of constellations of clinic-based um, risk factors to identify people that then may get suicide prevention and intervention strategies, such as the ones Dr. Riblet talked about. And I've been really compelled during this session by the focus on structural forces and systemic forces that actually are likely to increase people's suicide risk. Um, but these are things that are, of course, challenging to measure and identify in the types of data sources that we have been typically using um, for this other suicide prevention work, looking at constellations of risk factors. So I would ask all of you, what are your brilliant thoughts about how we move this forward, how we move from the place where we are, which is largely about identifying these individual clinic-based risk factors to something that incorporates the systemic risk factors um, and the structural risk factors that really probably are I would say actually, not probably, or definitely just as critically important. Um, I don't know who wants to jump in and take that first. It's a big question. <laughs> yeah. I'll, 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 oh, sorry, Julia. I'll just say a really quick thing. I think that our focus has been on risk 
And I think that we can turn that around and really focus on a constellation of protection and be thinking about the multi-level ways in which protection works. And I think we've, if you look at the research and how much has been done on suicide, it's been very narrowly focused, yes, on the individual and yes, on risk factors. And so we do need to broaden that and absolutely include risk on multiple levels, as well as protection. We're missing half of the boat. And I think it's really, really important. And when we assume that a one size fits all or that certain communities are just marginalized or just at risk, instead of having a lot of strengths that they bring to it, it's really limiting what we can see. And so again, to, to look at context. Absolutely. Julia, what were you going to add? I, I guess a couple of points. Um, I think Dr. Hassabuller uh, and his work have really inspired my work on this. I'll be excited to hear what he says as well. Uh, and I'll say that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic prompted us to try to scale up a lot of the work we've done previously, which is looking at the dates of policy change and how, uh, how health outcomes like suicidality have changed before and after those dates of policy change. And so now we've tracked those in that database. And I think um, creating data sets that have those systematic and policy level variables as well as the individual level variables is important. And then to the extent that we can start to capture mediators, you know, whether people have actually experienced racism, uh, whether they've actually experienced being denied a service because they're an LGBT person um, uh, and further factors like that, I think are really helpful. And, and for instance, one of the variables we're looking at with housing is uh, whether people have been uh, granted a break on rent by their landlord, and we're finding that there are big racial disparities and whether people are getting a break on rent from their landlord, and that that is um, contributing to the structural racism that is driving racial disparities and outcomes during the pandemic. So I, I think those kinds of variables and, and getting creative and, and using this moment to grow as, as a science um, is really important. So thank you for that question. Yeah, that's great. And Dr. Hatzenbuehler, Dr. Reifman mentioned you, so you can go next. All right, I'll, <laughs> I'll take up the, the potato, hot potato. Uh, well, I, I think I think Dr. Reifman's exactly right about uh, the creation of these new um, longitudinal data structures that are real time that are capturing these uh, measures of structural exposures. Um, at the same time, creating new data structures that also capture individual level mechanisms through which these broad structural exposures influence mental health outcomes, including suicide risk, because at the end of the day, these things have to be mediated at the individual level. And for understanding how to develop multi-level interventions, you need to know how to intervene at both the individual and the contextual level. And um, I guess I'll also say, um, you know, as a clinical psychologist, I sometimes who who does public health work. Also, I, I sometimes uh, find it a little amusing about the the idea that do, the reason we don't do the work at the structural level is because it's really hard to measure and hard to change at the structural level. And I'm here to say, at the individual level, it's also really hard to measure individual level phenomenon, especially, for instance, stigma and discrimination. I mean, that this is this is an active area of uh, contestation around how we measure that at the individual level, and also. As a clinical psychologist who used to have a practice, you know, it's really hard to change individual level behaviors as well. And so, um, you know, I, I think that we can't use that as, a, as an excuse because it's it's hard to do these things at, at the individual and the structural level as well. Um, so mm -hmm. hopefully, hopefully that will encourage us to um, to keep working at the structural level too. Absolutely. I just add like a one, just one minute. I think I think the other thing that we need to remember, and Dr. Wexler um, hinted at that, is that there are lots of things that communities do really well, and we tend to pathologize everything and focus on sort of the squeaky wheel, the bad stuff. But um, as important as it is to save lives, there's lots of lives being saved every day. And so I think part of what we have to do also is have some cultural humility and recognize that people often know how to save themselves, and they don't need us to be superheroes to do it and to ask them what they're doing that works well and to be humble enough to listen and learn that all that is knowable is not what we know, that these communities know a lot of things that we don't know. That's an excellent point. Thank you so much. Dr. Riblet, anything to add before we turn to Dean Galea to close us out? All right, thank you all so much. Dean Galea, I'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you everybody. First of all, thank you to Professor Raifman, Gradis, Wexler, Hudson, Buehler, Moloch, and Riblet. That, that was, um, an outstanding panel to uh, conclude the symposium. I, I was making notes while you were talking and I was thinking of um, trying to capture together, but I actually think this last two minutes of conversation really captured the, 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 uh, the talks and, uh, and really captured what I think is the take home for us. You know, when we talk about death by suicide, uh, 
in, in, I think in a public conversation, it implies sort of the most individual of uh, in the most individual of causes of death. But of course, what you've all shown us is that's not the case. That that the the individual cause of that is actually a cause of that that is rooted in society, rooted in economy, rooted in communities, and fundamentally, approaches to prevent suicide, which is what this is about, have to be broader population health approaches. So when we designed this, um, when uh, when the team of Professors Greatest Lipson, uh, Raithman, and Dolan designed this, really was can we think about suicide from a public health perspective? And I think it's exactly what this panel did. I think it's exactly what the whole symposium has done. I'm really grateful to you all. Really thank you to, to you all for teaching us today. And thank you to everybody in the audience for participating in this conversation.